Here we are at Lesson 8 of the Life and Ministry of the Apostle Paul. We are now at the midway point of our lesson plan. But before we continue, allow me to give a brief review of the information we have already covered. Lesson number one was entitled, Who Was Saul? This Man Who Became Known as the Apostle Paul. The conversion of Saul from zealous defender of legalistic Judaism and persecutor of Christians to humble servant of Jesus Christ was the subject of Lesson 2. In Lesson 3, we studied the years of solitude, the long period of time when God was teaching and molding Saul of Tarsus in preparation for his ministry as the Apostle to the Gentiles. The title of Lesson number 4 was The Apostle Paul Loved and Hated. What was there about this man that would cause deep love and loyalty from his friends and such fierce, unending hatred from his enemies? The first missionary journey begins in lesson number five. Barnabas brought Saul from Tarsus to help teach the Gentile believers in Antioch. The two men were later sent by the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to other lands. Lesson six followed the missionaries from Antioch to Cyprus and from Cyprus to the regions of Pamphylia, Phrygia, and Galatia as they established the first churches there. Lesson seven discussed the conflict, grace or law. Were the Gentile believers obligated to be circumcised and live under the Mosaic law as were the Jewish believers? Paul became the steadfast defender of the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in the finished work of Christ alone. And now let us prepare for lesson number eight, the second missionary journey begins. You may recall two lessons ago, as Paul and his companions left Cyprus and arrived in Pamphylia, that John Mark left the team and returned to Jerusalem. I mentioned that we would revisit this subject at the proper time. And as we come to the close of Acts chapter 15, the seed of John Mark's early departure would now bear sour fruit. Paul and Barnabas had just returned from the very important visit to the church leaders in Jerusalem where they presented the results of their first missionary journey. To Paul's delight, the church council agreed that the Gentile believers should not be burdened to obey the Mosaic law. And they wrote a letter to this effect, which Paul and Barnabas brought back to Antioch. The two missionaries stayed for a while in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. But this was probably for a short time. Acts 15, verse 36 and 7 states, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. This then became the source of a great conflict between Paul and Barnabas. And I must confess that I lean towards Paul's position in the matter. John Mark deserted the missionaries on their first trip. Why should Paul risk this happening again? On the other hand, I can also understand Barnabas. John Mark was his blood relative, and I can easily imagine how Mark must have felt after he returned to Jerusalem. First, there would be gladness and relief to be home, but shortly afterwards, he would have to explain his actions to others. The shame would arise. The knowledge that he had not only abandoned Barnabas and Paul, but he had also abandoned the work of the Lord. And soon the thoughts would begin to torment him, if only I had stayed, if only I had stayed. John Mark's torment would have gotten even more intense once Paul and Barnabas gave their report to the Jerusalem council. And I can picture him coming to Barnabas, confessing his sin and sorrow and asking for another chance. It is totally within the character of Barnabas, the encourager, the son of consolation, to give Mark that second chance. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed. Who was to be blamed for this division? Only God knows. 
but the end results were positive. All the new Gentile churches were visited again and strengthened, Barnabas to Cyprus and Paul to Asia Minor. Perhaps this was the Heavenly Father's plan all along, which Paul and Barnabas could not perceive at the time, being consumed by the disagreement and the emotions of the moment. But from our vantage point in looking back through history, we can identify specific blessings that came out of the conflict. First, this and other events in Paul's ministry help solidify the doctrines that he passed down to all of us through his letters. Nothing teaches us more acutely than the lessons we learn through experience. Paul emphasized repeatedly the importance of loving one another within the church through the bond of peace. He warned against contentions and divisions within the church. Would he? Could he be so adamant about these things? Had he never gone through the heartache of separation from a friend and brother like Barnabas? Paul taught the doctrine, all things work together for good, for them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Paul's life experiences in Christ, as with all of us who believe, bear witness to the truth of this doctrine. Let's look at the evidence as it applies to this circumstance. A. By going to Cyprus with Barnabas, John Mark found the restoration he sought, and later even his relationship with Paul would be restored. B. Barnabas, according to church history, remained in Cyprus for the rest of his life and became bishop of the first church there among his own kinsmen. C. Paul gained a new missions partner in Silas, a fellow Jewish believer and a Roman citizen who went with Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch after the Jerusalem Council. He was a prophet of the Lord, and apparently God had put a special love in his heart for the Gentile believers. The brethren at Antioch recommended Silas to be Paul's partner. So we see that in spite of the sharp disagreement and split between Paul and Barnabas, all things did work out for good for John Mark, Barnabas, Saul, and Silas, who were called according to God's purpose, as well as for the churches of Cyprus and Asia Minor. Paul's second missionary journey begins in the 41st verse of Acts 15. We see that Paul chose to take the overland route rather than travel by sea. This allowed Paul and Silas to pass through Syria and Cilicia, confirming other churches that were planted there, though probably not by Paul's personal ministry. Then they arrived in the region of Galatia, where the mission churches of Derbe, Lystra, and Iconium were thriving. All along the way, they delivered the decree ordained by the elders and apostles in Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Acts 16, verse 5. It sounds as though this part of the journey was uneventful, but in fact something significant took place in Lystra. Paul met a certain young man named Timotheus, whom we have come to know as Timothy. He was the son of a Greek man, but his mother was Jewish. And he was a Christian believer with a good reputation amongst the Christians of Lystra and Iconium. Timothy would become Paul's lifelong friend and disciple. More than this, the relationship would become like that of a father and son. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul opens with the words, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. This does not say that Paul led Timothy to faith in Jesus Christ, for he was already a disciple. It is more likely that he became a Christian under the influence of his mother and grandmother. For in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, we learn that Timothy had an unfeigned faith that had existed first in his grandmother Lois and in his mother Eunice. However, Paul was, in every other sense, a spiritual father and mentor. Timothy was a Jew by virtue of his birth to a Jewish woman, yet he had not been circumcised, so Paul made certain that this was done. This may seem odd coming from the man who constantly fought Judaizers against circumcising Gentile believers. But Timothy was not a Gentile. And if Timothy's ministry were to have any validity among the Jews, it was necessary that he be obedient to the law in this matter. And so, Timothy joined Paul and Silas on their journey, taking the position that John Mark was to have played on the first mission. Next, they visited Pisidian Antioch in the region of Phrygia. 
but soon they sought new territories to enter. We are told that the Holy Ghost forbade them from going east into Asia, so they went northwest and sought to enter Bithynia, which was located along the northern coast of modern-day Turkey. Turkey's capital city of Istanbul is located in what was then Bithynia, but again the Holy Spirit would not allow them to enter this region. We do not know the means by which the Holy Spirit closed the doors to these provinces. We are not told. We do not even know if it was to Paul to whom the Spirit spoke. Silas was a prophet, and the Holy Spirit may have communicated through him. But we do know that they were obedient to the guidance they received. They went instead to the port city of Troas, which was probably named after the ancient city of Troy, made famous by the Greek storyteller Homer, whose epic poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey, recount the destruction of the city. The missionaries rested at Troas, wondering what they should do next. One night, Paul had a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. In our next lesson, we will follow along as the gospel enters the European continent. Until then, may God increase your knowledge and understanding of his word.